All right, we're good to go. Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Heather Thompson. I work at the Pioneer Library System, which if you're from our area, which is we're in um, Courtney covers Cleveland County. Our library system covers Cleveland, Pottawatomie, and McLean counties in Oklahoma. And I know I've invited some people from gardening pages that might not be in Oklahoma, but we're glad you're here. So I'm going to share my screen, hopefully. And what we're going to do, oops, you're on my Facebook page. Hold on just a second. There we go. Okay, so everyone, this is the Pioneer Library System. I'm gonna go quickly just to show you briefly a few things that might be of interest to you. If you do not have a library card with us and you're interested, you can do that online. If you're outside of our, of our three counties I mentioned and you happen to be eligible for a Metropolitan Library card, then you're also eligible for one with us at no cost. Some other outlying areas that will be, a, be affiliated with it, but just let me know if you're interested. I can put my contact info in the chat box in just a minute. But if you do have a library card, I wanna show you that there's a lot of really fun information on databases here. And also if you have kiddos or you yourself are in school, there is fantastic resources here under educators and students. And the neat thing about this is it's sorted by age groups, but BrainFuse, I am going to bring this to your attention for students. This is, as it says here, is live assistance tutoring from kindergarten to 12th grade, but there are also some higher ed, I'd say some college level, assistance in there but also this little portion here that you can have access to a writing lab so you or your student can send in your paper that you're writing and a person a live person via computer will edit it in 24 hours they email it back so i think that's perfect for especially for people who are self-starters and may not you know you you can't always be in front of people anymore to have help there's also Flipster digital magazine. So there's some gardening magazines on there and the also movie boxes. Some of those are in service during this time. Our libraries do have some limited services. We are offering 30 to 30 minute computer use sessions. Also, we are doing printing and scanning services. We try to help you as much as we can on our, um, where you don't have to come into the library. There's also curbside pickup and also, the fun stuff is, well, all of it's fun, but Hoopla and Canopy are some of our streaming services. And I think last week we looked, but there's a lot of different gardening videos on Canopy. And I, again, can help you get set up with those streaming services. And then also audiobooks. So that will give you access to gardening books. And again, there's, look, see, if you don't have a library card, no problem. We'll get you set up. But there's gardening books in here too that are audio and digital and accessible with your library card. So I think I've talked enough. And uh, again, I'm Heather with the Pioneer Library System and I'm glad to be here and I love working with Courtney. Okay, now. Thanks, Heather. Thank I appreciate you. that. Um, I think if you stop sharing your screen, I can share my screen. Okay, hang on just a second. Sorry, Courtney, for some reason. Oh, stop share. I apologize. I just saw that. Thank no, you. it's all good. Okay. Well, thank you, Heather. I really appreciate you uh, being here tonight and helping me out. Heather uh, is going to be moderating this evening. Uh, so she will be helping me out as we uh, go through the presentation this evening. Can you see my screen? Thumbs up. Thumbs up. Okay. Awesome. So just a couple of housekeeping items real quick. Um, we will be keeping you muted. Uh, it's nothing personal. It's not that I don't want to hear your lovely voices. Just that sometimes there's background noise and it can be distracting for, for other participants. So uh, please keep yourself muted. Uh, because we're keeping everybody muted, please type your questions into the chat. We'll stop periodically to check the chat and Heather will kind of help me moderate that and let me know when uh, we've got quite a few questions. So please type your questions into the chat. 
Um, there is a pre-assessment survey that was sent out prior to this. Um, I think I had it in the chat. Let me share that again real quick. Maybe not. Maybe I messed it up. Um, well, it should be in your email. Uh, the pre-assessment survey uh, through SurveyMonkey. That just helps us tailor programming, uh, kind of know us how we, how we did this evening and help us out and evaluate and make sure that we're teaching you quality material. Uh, tonight, we will have um, a couple extra materials needed. Um, I sent out a paper calendar uh, beforehand, but if not, just anything that you can kind of write on and mark up. Um, ideally, we'll, um, we're going to kind of use this throughout the workshop and uh, hopefully when you finish, you'll have kind of a day-by-day -day guide to when to plant your fall crops. Uh, and then also to have two contrasting colored writing utensils. Uh, that way you'll see what we'll use those for a little bit later. Um, but just make sure you have those on hand, on hand. Uh, so thank you everybody for joining me this evening. It's August 4th, not August 8th. I'm not sure how that, that's not even a typo. That's just flat out wrong. Uh, but anyways, thank you for joining me this evening on this August 4th evening. This evening, we are going to be talking about fall gardening. Um, I think it's kind of appropriate, uh, sort of this weather the past couple days has sort of been a little bit of a tease for fall, at least here in central Oklahoma. And I, it's much needed at this point, right? It gets, it gets hot this time of year. Uh, so we'll get started. Um, for those of you who don't know me, oh yeah, Heather, question? Okay, can I ask you everyone a favor? Because she has 39 people on this, in the chat, will you put what, if you're comfortable, either the town and the state, or at least the state you're from? And congratulations, Courtney. I'm so excited. Oh, thanks. <laughs> This is the most people we've had on a webinar since I got started. We've been doing a lot of webinars since uh, since April, May, and so it's it's been fun to to get to see where people are from and and join you all virtually and still get to teach teach information. So I'm I thank you for being here. Uh, but those for those of you who don't know me and maybe haven't been on a webinar before, I am Courtney DeKalb Myers. I am the Cleveland County Horticulture Educator. So my position deals primarily with answering homeowner questions. Uh, so I'll get questions, you know. What's wrong with my tree? What's wrong with my lawn? How do I grow tomatoes? Um, those kind of come through our office and I sort of uh, help homeowners in the community answer those questions. I also manage and advise our Cleveland County Master Gardener Association. We have 115 absolutely wonderful volunteers um, and getting to work with them is a delight. And then I also get to teach workshops. Uh, teaching workshops are uh, maybe one of my favorite parts of my job because it's really nice to get to come out into the community and see different people and inspire people um, about gardening. So thank you again all for being here tonight. We will get started. Um, so it's hot, right? Middle of summer, uh, late summer. I mean, we're just worn out at this point. Um, you know, it's hard to be outside sometimes, maybe after a rain and then there's that 80% humidity. It's just exhausting. Well, you know what? We're worn out and so are our gardens. You know, if you planted your plants back in April, that's been about four months or so. Those plants have been in the ground um, and producing and, and being, uh, being your garden plants. So fall is really the perfect time to refresh our gardens and give us time uh, to kind of sort of wrap up, wrap up this season. So like I said, they're a great chance to start over. Um, so some of the benefits of fall gardening, the air starts to finally cool off. Um, we have, you know, not those days in the 90s, we start to get cooler mornings. I know this morning, I think it was in the 70s. So those days start to become more regular as we enter the fall. And it's a lot more pleasant to work in those, uh, in that environment than it is uh, in other, uh, in, during the rest of the summer the soil temperature is still warm. Uh, so a lot of times when we get started in the spring, the spring, the, the soil is still trying to warm up from the, from the winter time. Uh, but right now the soil is really starting to cool down and that happens a lot more slowly than the air temperature. So we end up with warm soil temperatures 
uh, that can really kind of help plants grow quickly and germinate quickly uh, during, during the fall. It's a little bit more predictable precipitation, at least in Oklahoma. Um, sometimes May can just be absolute downpour, just inches and inches of rain. Um, and at least in the fall, it tends to be, I don't want to say always, but it tends to be more consistent and maybe a little bit less everything all at once uh, during, during the fall. There are also fewer insects. Insects uh, reproduce and become more prolific when it is more hot outside. Uh, so they tend to uh, reproduce and, and have a higher populations with the heat. And so when we go into the cooler temperatures and things start to cool off, the insect populations do start to die down. Um, and then there's also less weed pressure. So, you know, in the springtime, everything is waking up, everything is starting to germinate and, you know, you're trying to get your plants to germinate, but the weeds are germinating right next to them. In the fall, it's a little bit slower uh, and we tend to have less weed pressure. So there are a lot of benefits of fall gardening and it's just a really great chance to start over and kind of refresh your garden. So this evening we will talk about six steps for the fall garden, starting with creating room for new plantings. Then we'll go into how to prepare the soil, uh, choosing what you're going to grow and what different things can be grown in a fall garden. Uh, and then really the meat of fall gardening, which is timing your plantings and knowing when to plant what so you can enjoy that harvest before the frost. Uh, and then also some tips and tricks on how to get seeds and transplanted started because, you know, when we start fall gardening, it's usually in August and things are still pretty hot. Uh, and then how to maintain the quality until we get to that sweet fall harvest uh, that we, we work so hard for. So first step, create room. Really, when it comes to creating room, uh, we've got two options. So you can either pull something out or you can build a new bed. Um, I suppose buying more land is not on that uh, on this slide. That is an option, but you know that's not that's not terribly practical for our fall garden. So, for the sake of this evening, we're going to say pull something out or build a new bed. So, what are maybe some good candidates for being pulled out of the garden? You know, maybe you've got some tomato plants and they're just starting to get tattered and they just don't look very healthy and they've kind of gone out of control. Not, and you're just, not, you're just kind of tired of looking at them. Pull it out. Or maybe you've got some squash plants and they're just absolutely infested with squash bugs and you just can't keep on top of those squash bugs and you never want to see another single squash bug as long as you live. Pull it out. Or maybe you have had a really successful year with okra and you and your family have had just had more okra than you know what to do with and just kind of ready for something new. Pull it out. It, maybe your plants have some diseases and you're kind of tired of like maybe every other bell pepper you get has sun scald or a disease on it and you're just, it's just not quite productive anymore. Pull it out. Or maybe your plants are just dead and you kind of need to replace them. <laughs> Pull it out. It's, it's kind of like, I like to sort of think about the, the Marie Kondo mentality of the, you know, if it doesn't spark joy, throw it out, get rid of it. That's really kind of the case when creating um, room for your plants in your garden for your fall garden. Uh, so, you know, if you're tired of it, you're tired of messing with it, that's a good spot for your fall garden. Other option, of course, is to build a new bed. Um, so there are some different kinds of options uh, when building a new bed or, or to designating a new area. Uh, raised beds definitely tend to be the more ideal situation for homeowners. A lot of times um, the soil and subdivisions might kind of be very heavily compacted or, or very heavily, uh, very heavy in clay or, or maybe other problem soils. Uh, so raised beds really kind of give us this nice little microclimate for us to be able to adjust and fix uh, and amend much easier than just planting into the ground. Uh, but of course, if uh, in planting is, is more your style, then by all means, go for it. Um, so to get started, mark the area, uh, kind of choose the area where you, want, uh, where you want that raised bed or that garden to be. Uh, and then if you are building a raised bed, you can construct the bed. Uh, there are many different materials that you can use to construct that bed. 
uh, wood, cement blocks, rocks. You tend to want to stay away from any wood that's been pressure treated, treated. Uh, any sort of like railroad ties. Those tend to have chemicals in them that will soak into your soil uh, and, and ultimately kind of into your vegetables. So you want to make sure uh, to avoid those as well. Uh, when building a raised bed or really kind of any sort of um, garden area, four feet tends to be the standard. And that's simply because, you know, us as humans, our arms are about two, two feet long. And so to get to the middle of that bed, um, any wider than that, and we might not be able to reach in all the way and be able to work with it quite as intimately uh, if it was much larger. So, you know, a lot of times you'll see four foot by eight foot. Um, that, that length can really sort of be whatever you want it to be, but four foot is typically the uh, standard size for a raised bed. So when you uh, begin to build your, uh, your bed or create a, a new area for your garden, um, you will have to kill out the Bermuda. Um, this is at my house from last year. We didn't have any Bermuda, but just pretend for the sake of um, this presentation, there's Bermuda in there and we have to smother it out. Um, so there's a lot of different options uh, when it comes to killing out the Bermuda. You can uh, simply smother it out. So cover it with black plastic uh, for about four to six weeks or so. Um, that will actually cook the Bermuda down and make it much easier to smother out. Or you can fill with cardboard and newspaper and then cover that with soil. Um, so the cardboard and the newspaper will smother out the Bermuda, but then also decompose over time uh, to kind of give you that full profile. And, and then just a tip, you know, when you go to, if, if you do choose to use cardboard or anything like that, make sure to take all of the tape and the shipping labels off of your cardboard before you use it for this purpose, uh, because then you will be digging out tape and shipping labels later. And I, I speak from personal experience on that one. Um, other option too, uh, to spray with uh, glyphosate or another broad spectrum herbicide. I know that there are, um, some health concerns in, in the general population regarding some of those, uh, those herbicides, but they are really kind of the easiest and quickest way to, to get the job done. Um, you can also simply just pull out Bermuda, but that is very labor intensive and kind of backbreaking over a large period of time because you want to try and get out all of those um, roots and all of those rhizomes. Otherwise you'll be uh, fighting that Bermuda in your in your raised bed or your garden. And then you've constructed your bed, you've killed that, uh, that existing vegetation out, uh, you'll want to fill it with soil. Uh, so we were kind of joking on where do you get dirt, where does dirt come from uh, before the webinar started. But uh, to fill your raised beds, uh, you mostly want topsoil. Uh, Mel Bartholomew, who is the author of the Square Foot Gardening books, he recommends one-third topsoil, one-third compost, and one-third potting soil in your raised beds, um, but generally kind of sort of up to you on your preference. Um, it's kind of a good idea to add some compost and some potting soil into that topsoil just so uh, you can maintain some moisture and it, it kind of really helps with drainage in those raised beds as well. So step number two, preparing the soil. Um, so you've got your dirt, you're ready to go. You want to know what exactly is in your dirt. So what nutrients do you have? Um, maybe what's the pH? Um, you know, we kind of can ask ourselves, well, how do you fertilize? Well, really the best way to go about fertilizing is to get a soil test and then know exactly what is needed in the soil instead of trying to do this guessing game instead. Um, so your local county extension office should be able to offer you a soil test. I will speak about the ones that we offer uh, through Oklahoma State, but by all means, just call your local county extension office uh, and they should have more details for you. So to take a soil sample, uh, what you want to do is take 15 to 20 random cores from the area that you're interested in. Uh, so if it was your vegetable bed, take those 15 to 20 random cores from, from your vegetables. Um, generally, if there's big differences between um, the area, so maybe if you have raised beds on one side of the house and raised beds on the other side of the house, and you've seen just kind of differences in growth patterns, 
you might want to do two separate soil samples. But generally, um, if you're growing the same thing, kind of the same general thing throughout that area, one soil sample should do the trick. Uh, so 15 to 20 random samples from within the area that you're interested in really sort of evens out the average. Um, a tool that can be very helpful is a soil probe. Um, it sort of is able to go actually all the way into the ground to get those soil samples at our office. Um, we check those out, uh, but if, if you're not in our area, just again, call your local county extension office and see if they can check you a probe out. It makes the job so much easier. Uh, you can also use bulb planters or sharpshooters, but really the idea is to get down about six inches. Um, that really gives us a good profile of where the roots are within that plant. Um, so you wanna go from about six inches down. You wanna take those 15 to 20 random cores uh, from six inches down and you want to mix them together in a clean bucket. Mixing them together uh, to kind of create a composite. When we get that, when you create that composite, we'll need about three cups or so uh, to be able to send that off and get that tested. Uh, and that can show you a variety of things. We have different soils, uh, soil samples through the office, but generally the one I mostly recommend to people, especially if you're just getting started on a vegetable garden, uh, would be a routine soil sample. And so that's going to show your pH, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Those are the uh, really kind of major nutrients that plants need in your, uh, in your garden. Now, if you're growing something highly specific, or maybe you're starting to see some problems and you're not really sure what's going on, we might look into secondary nutrients or micronutrients, uh, but generally those are going to be adequate within the soil. Uh, organic matter is going to show you the amount of decomposed material within your soil. Um, that can kind of be helpful sometimes. Soil texture will show you the breakdown uh, of whether or not it's very clayey or whether or not it's sandy or somewhere in the middle. And then the salinity test will show you your salts. Uh, but generally for vegetable gardening, just getting started, just kind of trying to know what's going on, what's needed, a routine soil sample is, is what you're going to need. Um, it's $10 if you're in Oklahoma, uh, but like I said, just check with your local county extension office if you're not sure uh, what the services they offer are. So um, maybe you've already done a soil test this year and you were adequate on everything in the early in the season. Um, so something you might want to do is simply just amend with a little bit of nitrogen. So nitrogen is the um, nutrient that is responsible for the leafy green growth and it's the, what, the nutrient that is most readily used by plants. So amending with a little bit of nitrogen into the soil can just kind of give them a nice kickstart um, because that's likely the nutrient that has become deficient over time would be the nitrogen. And then if you go to buy fertilizer um, and you're looking at a fertilizer bag, those three numbers there represent nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. So that's NPK. Um, so that fertilizer bag there is 13, 13, 13. That will mean it has 13% nitrogen, 13% phosphorus, and 13% potassium. There are a lot of different formulations of fertilizer out there and you can get um, really kind of what you need necessarily for what's deficient in your soil. Um, but if you get a soil test, um, through us or a local county extension office, they should be able to interpret the results for you and be able to tell you, you know, what fertilizer you should buy and at what rate you should, uh, you should put it down. Um, there are a lot of organic fertilizer options as well. Um, so if you are, are kind of focused on organic gardening and you don't want to use maybe the synthetic products, uh, these are some of the more common ones that you would see. Blood meal is a great one to add nitrogen. Bone meal is typically higher in that phosphorus, so it's got that 21 phosphorus. Um, and then um, kelp is one that you might use for if you were deficient in potassium. Um, so if you're, if you're trying to grow organically, you should still check your soil uh, and still make amendments based on your soil test, but you want to probably you're going to try and stick to these more natural 
uh, naturally derived minerals rather than the synthetic ones. Uh, but like I said, lots of, lots of options out there. So what will you grow? Um, that's a big question for fall gardening. Um, so we have the warm season crops and we have the cool season crops. When it comes to picking out warm season crops for fall gardening, you want to choose ones that are going to take about less than 90 days to come to maturity. Any longer than that, and it we've missed it. We've missed the window. So look for varieties that have very short, um, excuse me, or shorter days to maturity. So ideally less than 90. Uh, so some example of that are gonna be beans, sweet corn, cucumbers, eggplants, peppers, squash, tomatoes. Um, things like pumpkins, it's gonna be a little bit too late. Um, sweet potatoes, it's gonna be a little bit too late. So just um, check your days to maturity. And then the cool season crops, the cool season crops, this is their time to shine. Um, so I've got a whole, a whole long list there, but you know, things like beets, your root vegetables, so carrots, beets, turnips, um, your brassica vegetables. So those are going to include broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cabbage. Um, those are all, all your cool season, all your cool seasons. And then a lot of the leafy greens as well too. So your lettuces and your spinach, um, definitely the, the salad bowl mix of vegetables for, for the cool season. And then there's also the biennials. So these are planted in September and then harvested in late spring the following year. So that's your garlic or your onions. Um, so if that's something you're interested in, what you do is you kind of plant them early enough in the fall so that they have time to develop and can make it through the cool weather of our, of our winters and then are able to be harvested the next, the following following next year. Uh, but I, I grew a bunch of garlic last year and I'm gonna grow a bunch again this year. That's one of my favorite things to grow is garlic. So timing, like I said, this is really the meat of fall gardening. It's crucial. So basically you have a window between now and your first, fraud, your first freeze that you have the chance to do fall gardening. So you kind of have to be strategic. You kind of have to know when that first freeze date is going to be in plan based off that because if we have a you know a, a day that looks like this that's that's going to kill your garden um, so we want to make sure that we have um, you want to kind of sort of do your fall gardening and have your harvest before we get to this point because that's going to be um, much too cold for those plants so what you have to do is determine your freeze dates so this is from um, Dave's Garden. There's a lot of different, um, Farmers, Farmer's Almanac has some. There's a lot of different places where you can look up your freeze date. But this is for the Oklahoma, Oklahoma City area. If you're in another, another spot, I recommend just you know, real quickly kind of maybe on the side Google searching where you are um, and what your average last freeze date is. So the way this, um, we're kind of going to focus on the bottom half of this graph because those are, those are the fall dates. So the top half is the spring day, but we're talking about fall gardening today. Um, so uh, there, that's going to be a freeze. So if we get below, you know, when we start to get around 32 degrees, then uh, that's going to be a freeze. And then to the right of that is the percentage of the date that we might have uh, that first freeze date. So, you know, last year we had a very early freeze. Um, it was definitely that 10% mid-October. Um, but, you know, there are years where we might not have a freeze until the end of November. So there's, uh, so, you know, just kind of sort of gauging those percentages and then how much you want to push it or, or test it out. And then also a hard freeze, which is going to be below 28 degrees. And that's where those cool season crops are, are going to maybe suffer a little bit. So they can tolerate some freeze, but a hard freeze is going to generally be kind of hard on um, some of those, some of those crops. You might also hear weathermen or people talk about a frost. Frost is a little bit more elusive. It generally happens between 30 degrees and 36 degrees Fahrenheit, um, but it does depend on the moisture within the air. 
uh, and what kind of the humidity is on whether or not we're going to have a frost. But for the sake of this evening's workshop, um, we're going to go with about a 50% chance, a 50-50 split for our average last freeze day and our average last, excuse me, first freeze day and our average last, average first hard freeze day. Um, so I asked you guys to have a paper calendar with you. Um, if you wouldn't mind getting that out um, and going to uh, going to November or uh, whatever your first freeze dates are. And so if you are in the central Oklahoma area, I want you to write on November 2nd with one of your colored pencils or writing utensils, I want you to write last freeze date. And then with your other colored writing utensil, I want you to go to November 13th and write last, or I'm sorry, I'm getting mixed up on that first. I hope you know what I meant. I apologize. First freeze, first hard freeze date. Okay, so your, your paper should look like you've got the first freeze date on November 2nd and the first hard freeze date on November 13th. So we're kind of averaging it a little bit um, with that 50%. If you're kind of risky and maybe you want to push it a little bit and you want to go with maybe one of those more 70 to 80% chances of the first freeze date, by all means. If maybe you're a little bit more conservative, you want to make sure you get that, those harvests, you might go a little bit earlier. Uh, but for the sake of this evening, we're going to kind of go with those, those two dates with the 50%. So now what I want you to do, and this takes a little bit, but it makes it way easier later is I want you to count backwards. So with your last free or your first freeze date, which is gonna happen on November 2nd, I want you to go to November 1st and write a one and then continue numbering backwards. So November 1st would be one, October 31st would be two, 30th would be three, 29th would be fourth and continue going back and numbering that way until you get to today, which is August 4th. I feel like I should put some music on for you guys. <laughs> And when you start to get finished with that, what I want you to do next is do the exact same thing in your contrasting colored writing utensil, but go back from the first hard freeze date. So that would be November 12th would be one, November 11th would be two, 10th would be three, and so on and so forth. And I want you to do that all the way till today, which is August 4th.
Okay, I think we should be close to getting wrapped up. I'll give you guys just a couple more, 30 more seconds. Uh, where's my handout? <laughs> I don't write that much anymore. Okay, so you should have today um, in the first freeze date, so that's gonna be the earlier date, uh, 90 days. And then in the first hard freeze date, which is the later date, 101, is that right? Okay, I'm getting some nods, okay. All right, so you'll see how where, where this comes in next. So it's all about timing, right? So when you purchase a seed packet, somewhere on that seed packet, you should see days to harvest. Um, so in that one, you can see it right there, but I've got a seed packet right here and it's on the back uh, in the bottom right there. So days to harvest. It should be uh, somewhere on that seed packet. If you are shopping in a seed catalog, it should also have it in the description. Um, so it, when you purchase seeds, it should have that information on it. So starting with, uh, we'll start with our warm season crops. So for the warm season crops, we're gonna use the first freeze date as our basis. So that's the earlier date. So for cherry tomatoes, uh, this is the example I have right here. Uh, it's gonna take 70 to 75 days to maturity. So 70 to 75 days back from that first freeze date would be about August 19th to August 24th, right? So that's kind of generally the time frame where we want to plant that particular, uh, that particular plant. Now with the warm season crops, um, as temperatures cool off, they're not going to grow quite as fast. Um, so we want to give ourselves a little bit of a buffer, maybe an extra week or so, because we need to accommodate for uh, that time. So for tomatoes, um, particularly this example right here, that 70 to 75 days, I would maybe bump it back about a week or so, and maybe somewhere between August 12th and August 14th, and then go ahead and write that on your calendar. And then that way you will know to plant tomatoes on that date uh, in order to get a harvest uh, before that average first freeze date. Uh, now some other kind of tidbits in regards to tomatoes, uh, they do not tolerate freeze. So like I said, we want to give ourselves kind of a buffer, probably plant tomatoes between uh, next, before next week sometime uh, to make sure that we get something before the first freeze date. Um, they do take up about three feet by two feet, so kind of sort of as you're allocating space and looking for space, that's about how much room you'd need for one tomato plant. When it comes to picking out tomato varieties, especially when it comes to the fall, you want to go with those faster varieties. Uh, so cherry tomatoes, tomatoes do tend to be faster than um, our regular slicer types. Uh, so you might, if you're maybe looking to make some uh, dehydrated tomatoes for the for the winter or something like that. Maybe a cherry tomato is a good option for you. Um, so they are going to go much faster than the slicer types. Determinate tomatoes are also another option. So determinate tomatoes are tomatoes that are going to put out all their flowers all at once, all their fruit all at once, and then they're going to ripen all at once. Um, so that way you can get all of your harvest right before uh, that freeze date. And so things like the canning tomatoes, like the Romas, um, those are all typically going to be um, your, your determinant type tomatoes. The, the indeterminate type tomatoes, those are ones that will grow a little bit, put on some fruit, grow a little bit, put on some fruit, and then the other fruit will ripen and sort of come on more gradually. We don't necessarily want to grow those in the fall um, because by the time it grows and you get one or two tomatoes, we're gonna get a freeze. So we have, ideally you wanna choose um, either those cherries that will come on quite a bit faster or the determinant tomatoes. Uh, zucchini, this is our next example. So the seed packet there says 63 uh, days till harvest, but generally um, 55 to 63 days uh, is where we kind of are going to want to be. So that would be between August 31st and September 8th. But like I said, it's a warm season crop. So we want to give ourselves a little bit of a buffer. 
Um, so I'm going to bump it up a week beforehand and say, let's plant zucchini on August 24th. So again, go ahead and write that on your calendar as a reminder to plant it on that date. Uh, and again, this is one that has no freeze tolerance. Um, so you probably want to give yourself a better buffer or be a little bit more conservative when planning on this one. Um, because once we get that freeze, it's going gonna, it's gonna to wipe it out. Uh, they do take up quite a bit of space. So if you're looking for a room to clear or an area where you want to have zucchini, you will need to devote about three feet by four feet uh, for that for one plant. Uh, and then just a note, when uh, you want to pick your zucchini, ideally you want to pick it off when the blooms fall off and then also when that skin can be pierced with a fingernail. So that means that it's it's just, it's just about big enough uh, for you to eat. Now zucchini can uh, get very large if we miss it before, before harvest time, um, but it probably won't be growing that fast in the fall. Yellow squash, very similar to zucchini, um, but it's gonna be a little bit quicker. And the days for it, the 50, if you back up 50 to 53, is gonna be September 10th to September 13th. But again, I want to do, I want to give myself some room. I want to give it time to grow. So I'm going to bump it back a week and I'm going to say September 3rd. Let's do September 3rd for yellow squash. Courtney? Uh, yes, Heather. Um, I, I have a few questions on here. One that goes along with what you're talking about. It's okay, in... sure. Yeah, I apologize. I haven't stopped for questions yet. So let's do that. I've been listening. So the question that pertains to now is, can you actually plant these things earlier than what yes. you're in now? Okay. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, you can plant them earlier. Okay, this other one goes back to, let me go find it. I apologize, I should have brought this one up. It was, can you, do you go down six inches into the dirt to take your soil sample, like down into the dirt? Yes. You want a six inch profile of that dirt. Um, so if it's in a raised bed, you know, it's six inches within to that raised bed. You don't necessarily have to go six inches into the dirt of where kind of like the earth actually starts, um, but six inches into what you're growing into. Okay, so it's basically from the top down, you need six inches. Yeah, okay. from that surface level down six inches is what you'll need. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. I apologize I hadn't stopped for questions earlier. Um, okay, so uh, squash, similar uh, row plant spacing, three feet to 18 inches, and then again, harvesting kind of at a similar stage as to that zucchini. Um, bush or uh, bush beans, so that's going to take about 52 to 55 days to harvest. So that's going to put us at the last possible plant date of September 8th to September 11th. So again, giving ourselves a little bit of a buffer. Let's back that up a week. You know what, we put yellow squash on September 3rd. Um, so I'm already gonna be out on the garden that day. Let's put bush beans at the same time. Let's do that on September 3rd as well. So that'll give us a little bit of an extra week. Um, so uh, bush beans do need, um, if you're going to do a row by plant spacing, uh, 20 inches by 4 inches. Um, but if you're planting on a grid, just 4 inches by 4 inches. Um, if you're picking out varieties for beans, bush beans mature much more quickly than pole beans. Uh, they also tend to put on a little bit more all at once. Um, so they're probably going to be the better option for fall gardening as opposed to pole beans, which are a little bit slower, uh, but do give you kind of a longer harvest. Um, so those are the examples for the warm season crops, but by all means, whatever you're choosing to plant, um, just look at those days to maturity and for warm season, back it up from that first freeze date. So now we're going to talk about the first hard freeze date and talk about some of our cool season veggies, uh, starting with broccoli. So broccoli takes about 80 to 90, 90 days to harvest. So for that one, we're going to look at our calendar and we're going to find 80 to 90 days, 85 to 90 days. And we're going to look for that contrasting color and that's going to be about August 
15th to August 20th. So somewhere in there, we wanna make sure we get our broccoli planted. Broccoli does tolerate a freeze. Um, so that's kind of why we're basing it off that hard freeze date rather than a, uh, rather than the other date. So it kind of can give us the same time. We don't have to buffer this one quite as much because they are cool season veggies and they do thrive in the cooler temperatures as opposed to those warm season veggies which grow a quite a bit slower. Some harvesting notes on the broccoli. Uh, when heads reach about three to six inches diameter, that's when you want to cut it uh, and that's when you can eat it. You don't want your heads to get too loose. You still want them to be fairly compact. Uh, if they get too loose, it's, it's a sign that they're starting to get over mature. And then the fun thing about broccoli is too, is once you cut those, once you cut that main head off the broccoli, that's when side shoots will start to develop and you can have a continued harvest that way. Um, so you kind of get your big main broccoli harvest and then you kind of get some side shoots uh, that maybe you can add into some pastas or some, some other salads then. Okay, carrots take about 65 to 75 days. So looking at our calendar, that's gonna put us between August 30th and September 9th. Um, so maybe go ahead and put carrots on August 30th. Carrots will tolerate some low temperatures. Um, so that's kind of a good thing in case we get those early temperatures, those early freezes, uh, kind of like we did last year. Uh, if you were doing a row plant spacing, it'd be one foot by two inch or uh, two inch by two inch if you're planting on a grid. And then the thing with carrots too is that you really need loose soil for the best shape. Carrots, their roots, they go, they grow down. And so if they start to encounter maybe heavy soil clods or rocks or maybe particularly bad wood chips, they're going to grow around that. And then when you harvest it, you're going to get a lot of wonky shaped carrots. Uh, so make sure you have very loose, very um, uh, soil that has been kind of worked with lots of organic matter so that those carrots have no problem as they start to grow down. Peas, peas are going to take about 58 to 72 days depending on your variety. So that's going to put us between September 2nd and September 16th. Um, so maybe go ahead and write peas on September 2nd. Peas have very little freeze tolerance, um, so they are cool season, but if we do have those prolonged temperatures of cool weather, um, we, uh, you will start to see some damage in your peas. Um, they do need a trellis most often um, for the majority of the harvest, um, so kind of factor that in as you choose where to put your peas and the spacing for them. Uh, and then also choose varieties with a quick harvest. So they don't have, though they are cool season, they, they tolerate very little freeze, very little low temperatures. So make sure you kind of choose one that's really gonna be quick and help you out that way. Uh, beets is our next example. So beets are gonna take 60 days. So that would put us on September 14th. So go ahead and write that on September 14th. That's the day you'll want to plant your beets. The last day you can plant your beets. And um, uh, yes, lost my train of thought there for a second. Okay, so beets do tolerate, uh, do tolerate again, freeze like carrots. Um, again, they're a root vegetable, so make sure you have loose soil. Um, the shape as beets, you know, that it's not as difficult to come by as that nice long carrot, um, but still, the looser you have that soil, the less work, work and effort they have to put in to creating those nice roots that we want to eat, uh, the better. Uh, generally harvest when roots are about three inches in diameter, any bigger than that, and they're going to kind of be woody, maybe hard to chew on. Um, so that's kind of the, uh, the strategy there. Fun thing with beets too, very closely related to um, Swiss chard. So you can also kind of cook the tops in the same way that you would switch chard. Um, so kind of an all around harvest with, with the beets. Lettuce, uh, lettuce is gonna take about on average 45 to 57 days depending on harvest. So that's gonna put us at 
September 17th to September 29th. So let's go ahead and say September 17th, let's go ahead and write lettuce. Now lettuce um, does prefer 75 degree days and 45 degree nights. Um, I'd say I do too, quite honestly. <laughs> um, but if we get any hotter than that, that's when we'll start to uh, kind of get some bitter taste. So it's really important as we're growing lettuce and we're trying to get it established, we wanna make sure that it's very well watered. Um, that way it doesn't develop those bitter compounds too early. Um, it does tolerate some freeze, um, but kind of below, kind of a hard freeze or anything below that, it will struggle. Spinach, similar to lettuce, 45 to 50 days. Uh, so that will put us at September 24th to 29th. So on your calendar, let's go ahead and choose September 24th. Yeah, September 24th for spinach as the last day you can plant your spinach. Uh, good thing about spinach is it's a lot more cold tolerant than, uh, than the lettuce. So you can um, generally harvest this one more into the winter than you can lettuces. And then last but absolutely not least, uh, our example for this evening is radishes. Uh, so radishes are a very quick turnaround, about 20 to 25 days. Uh, and so we can push that one as far back as October 19th to October 24th. Um, so for the sake of our calendar that we're working on, let's go ahead and go October 19th. Let's put that down as our radish planting day. If we plant them in warm temperatures, uh, they will start to kind of take on a weird flavor and a weird texture. Sometimes we refer to that as kind of being pithy. Um, but if we plant that later, that's when we'll have uh, those high quality radishes. Uh, so I know I had the question about can you plant earlier on these and absolutely yes you can. That's uh, kind of what this slide is for. So the idea um, with secession planting, secession planting is kind of the concept of we're going to plant um, some of our stuff and then plant a little bit more of it later. Uh, because if we planted a whole entire raised bed of radishes all at once, and then they har we harvested those all at once, that would be more radishes than I can eat. Uh, maybe more than you, I don't know your eating habits. If you eat that many radishes, good for you, but I know I sure can't eat that many radishes. So the idea with secession planting is to kind of make your harvests gradual by timing your plantings out. Um, so each of those days that we talked about um, for planting those specific crops, what you can do is go a week beforehand and put in another day. So for example, I'm just kind of looking at this calendar, um, thinking like carrots. So carrots are a once over harvest. Once you harvest the carrot, you don't get to eat any more of it. So for harvesting those carrots, I'm also gonna add in a planting date the week before. Um, so our carrot planting date we had decided on was August 30th. So I'm gonna go back a week before and add another carrot planting date on August 23rd and then go another week beforehand and add another one on August 16th. And so that will kind of give us a succession planting uh, that will sort of give us staggered harvests throughout the season. Um, and so I'll, uh, you guys after this workshop, if you want to go through each individual of those ones where we set the date, go back a little bit and add those succession plantings in so that you can uh, know when to have those various staggered harvests. Now, if you're trying to push that average first freeze date to kind of, uh, maybe you say, oh, I bet this, you know, we had a really early one last year. I bet it'll be later this year. Um, if you wanna push it, then you can do staggered harvests afterwards. And then that way you only lose that little bit of a chunk just in the case uh, Mother Nature proves you wrong and we get a freeze uh, earlier than expected. So that's kind of the idea with succession planting is to go back and forth beforehand uh, to sort of give those staggered harvests throughout the season. Heather, do we have any questions at this point? We have a couple of built up, which is why I'm raising my hand. Okay, so, thank you. Yeah, 
So a question is, do you recommend the fairy morse seeds that you were showing as a best choice? Not necessarily. We had received a large donation of seeds in the office. And so that was kind of how I took those pictures. They were ones I had in, uh, in the office. I, I will say I've planted some of those seeds and had good success, um, but that wasn't necessarily an endorsement. Okay. Um, getting them sort of, uh, you know, uh, there's, there's a lot of great seed sources out there and I, I don't recommend just one. Okay, and that, so then we've got someone else asking if you offer any kind of seeds to purchase or do you have any that you could give away? Um, if you're in Cleveland County, I have got a lot in the office. Um, so by all means, come by, swing by, I'll, uh, I'll get you hooked up. But I know that getting seeds can be kind of challenging this time of year. Sort of, uh, we see in the springtime, kind of like right in February, that's when all the box stores will start to have their big seed displays. So as of right now, it's kind of like what's left over from that. Um, so it can sometimes definitely be hard to find seeds this time of year. Um, if you have any left over from your spring plantings, those are great candidates, candidates as well. Um, but, you know, this year was kind of unique and there was um, a pandemic and a lot of people got into gardening this year, which is great. That's awesome. Um, but a lot of people went out and bought a lot of seeds. And so normally I would say this time of year, um, places will have seeds on clearance and you can get seeds typically, um, you know, 40 to 50% off depending on where you go. But I, I will admit it's been a little bit harder this year to find them. Okay. So the next question is when you were referring to the broccoli for planting, were you speaking of seeds or transplants? Seeds. Seeds. Mm -hmm. If you have transplants, it will cut down on that uh, on that time quite a bit. Um, so just kind of sort of factor that in. I, maybe you could probably push it another week or two. Okay. Like you could shave off that time. Sure. So the next question was, where can you buy seeds at this time of year? Any suggestions? Um, Definitely check with your box stores. Um, I will say probably more likely going to have them than maybe um, uh, like the Lowe's Home Depot or Walmart are going to be maybe farm supply stores. So check with Atwoods if you have a local farm supply store in the area. Um, and then garden centers as well would probably have them. Also check at farmer's markets. Sometimes uh, growers at farmer's market will also have transplants available. Um, for fall gardening, so check that, uh, you know, always check your farmer's market out as well, which it's National Farmer's Market Week, by the way. So there's my, there's my endorsement for that. Yay. Okay, I missed this one. Um, so when thinking about the spacing, do you want to plant seeds according to, to that or plant them more densely and then thin the ones that are not as robust? It, so it, I will say if you have um, an old seed packet or maybe a seed packet and you're not really sure how it was stored and you're not really sure the quality or maybe it's just old and left over, I would maybe go more dense and then thin um, because you don't know if you're going to have quite the same germination rate. But if you've got a fresh seed packet or a seed packet that you know has been stored uh, properly, then I, I wouldn't maybe necessarily go with that so much because then you're kind of wasting those transplants or those those little those little babies. Um, so if it's been stored and you know you're going to have a high germination rate, I would go off what the seed packet says. Um, but if it's older and you're not really sure, um, go a little bit more dense and dense because you don't know if what your germination rate is going to look like. Okay, is that are we good? We all cut it. Fantastic. Okay, I appreciate the questions. Thank you all. Um, okay, so step five, we have our schedule, we're ready to go, we're ready to get started on our fall gardening, let's get some plants in the ground. Um, so when it comes to uh, starting plants in the fall, uh, or excuse me, for fall gardening, but we're starting them in the heat of summer, right, it's August right now. Um, so it's going to be very hot, the soil is going to dry out very quickly, so we kind of need to baby our seeds a little bit, maybe more than we would normally in the spring. Um, so consistent moisture is going to be crucial. Um, seeds need cons 
consistent moisture in order to germinate uh, and to have success. Um, so make sure you're paying attention to irrigation, maybe even watering twice a day um, until those temperatures really start to cool off. So we really kind of want our baby baby our plants for the next month or so until the fall temperatures really do start to set in. Um, a trick for uh, starting, your, starting your plants and your seeds can be to add peat moss in with the hole as you plant your seeds. So peat moss holds on to a lot of moisture. It's very, uh, very has a very high moisture retention. Um, so putting a little bit of peat moss with your seeds as you plant them uh, can kind of sort of maintain that consistent moisture in that area around that seed as those seeds start to start to germinate. You can also um, consider covering with a shade cloth. So if you have um, maybe like low tunnels or something over your raised beds, covering with a shade cloth uh, to lower temperatures can, can really help, help those seeds. But like I said, right now the goal is really just to baby them until we get to those truly consistent fall temperatures. Square foot gardening, um, when it comes to planting and talking about spacing, square foot gardening is a very popular strategy. Um, and I say it's probably more effective among the cool season veggies than it is the warm season veggies. Um, and it makes space much more efficient. So going back to those um, slides or looking at your seed packet, they're always gonna have a, uh, a spacing on them. So a plant by row spacing. And so when you look at that spacing, instead of planting based on rows, it's planting based on grids. So you choose that smallest interval and plant on a grid rather than uh, necessarily planting in rows like the bottom picture. Uh, so it's that top versus the bottom picture. But like I said, it probably tends to be more efficient with the cool season veggies, uh, just because those warm season veggies like tomatoes and squash, they get very large. Uh, and really even larger than a square foot necessarily. But with things like radishes and beets and lettuce, square foot gardening is ideal because you can squeeze a lot of it into a small area. Um, so definitely check that out and consider the spacing as you go to plant so you can get more, uh, more into a small area. Now, uh, we were talking about seeds a little bit, but um, like I said, if you, um, you know, always use what you have, um, seeds don't last forever, so if you have some radishes left over from the spring, go ahead and use those um, if they were properly stored. And so by that, I mean in a cool, dry spot. If you maybe left them in your garage and it's been really hot and you're not really sure, um, that might be where uh, an instance where you overseed like we were talking about. Um, but if not, um, if you're starting from scratch and maybe you're online or staring at a wall of seeds within, um, within the garden center, look for varieties that have quick days to harvest and cold tolerance. Um, so that, that days to maturity, if you had an option between one that took 60 days to maturity and one that took 85 days to maturity, definitely go for the 60 day one. That way you have a better chance of getting it before uh, before that first freeze date. Um, so when looking at descriptions and various things, this is an example of spinach seed. Um, there it says a fast maturing variety. Uh, you might also things, see things like winter hardy or cold tolerant or for a late crop or fall and winter harvest or good for overwintering. So these are all kind of things that you might see when looking for, uh, looking for seeds that would be ideal for fall plantings. Uh, so kind of sort of read the description and decide based off that. Okay, we've got the seeds in the ground, we're ready to go. Let's maintain this garden so we can get a harvest. Um, irrigation is crucial. So right now it's August, it's hot. Um, it's, the soil dries out very quickly. And, and it tends to be kind of rougher on our plants. And we're trying to start new plants, uh, and that can be a very harsh environment to start new plants in. So supplemental irrigation um, is really gonna be needed, maybe even going out there twice, twice a day, especially if we're trying to grow those cool season crops. So, you know, on our calendar, we've got broccoli set in the next couple of weeks and carrots set in the next couple of weeks. Those are really gonna need quite a bit of moisture once we get those planted because um, that's going to really lower the temperature. 
What you can also do, um, kind of a recommendation would be to maybe plant in mounds. Um, so kind of mound up your soil and plant into those mounds and then build furrows or like little moats around the side and then fill that with water. So that water will kind of slowly infiltrate into that mound uh, and kind of keep that moisture consistent within that mound for a longer period of time uh, than it would be if it was just kind of sort of flat. So that's what that picture there is on the right, uh, kind of an aerial view of a mound um, where the furrows had been flooded and that will stay uh, quite a bit more moist um, throughout that, uh, throughout the day than if it were just kind of planted flat. Mulches are another uh, very important way to maintain moisture within the soil. Um, so yeah, that first bullet point there, retain moisture in the heat of the summer. So they kind of act as a blanket to really hold that moisture into the soil. It also really helps with soil temperature. So if we have, you know, if we start to get into September and then we have a day out of nowhere where it's 92, um, that if that soil was uncovered, it would heat up very quickly. Uh, but if we had a mulch on it, it would kind of sort of cover it up, kind of keep it uh, well insulated and help with those uh, jumps in temperature. It also helps control weeds, smothers out weeds as we go through it. Um, and then if you use an organic mulch, um, and so by that I don't necessarily mean certified organic, I mean uh, something that's going to break down over time. If you use something that's going to break down over time, it's going to slowly add more organic matter back to the soil, um, which really sort of helps the, the health and the vitality of the soil. So these are some examples of mulches, uh, some organic mulches. A lot of people too will ask me, um, you know, what's the best mulch to use? And I'll, I'll say, you know, use what you have. Um, in fall, it's perfect because leaves uh, will start to fall from the tree and you can rake that up and it's instant mulch. Um, so that is a really easy way to get free mulch for your gardens in the fall. Um, if you have a pine tree, rake up those pine sh that pine straw. Uh, maybe you have a Halloween decoration. Um, and so November 1st, you're putting your, your hay bales left over from your Halloween decoration into your raised bed, so you know, just use what you have on hand. And then also season extension. So we were talking about the first freeze dates and the first hard freeze date. Um, that would really necessarily be if we didn't have any sort of covering or took any sort of precautions to warm up our veggies once it got cold. Uh, so these are some examples of some ways we can really extend the season um, and really push that date back even further. Um, so low tunnels would be where we have uh, kind of an arch over our raised beds and then we cover that with some sort of frost blanket or some sort of plastic where it really insulates and kind of almost creates in a way like a mini greenhouse over our raised beds. High tunnels are simply the same thing as low tunnels except we can walk in them. Um, so this is an example from someone's backyard where they had built a high tunnel over their raised beds. Um, pretty cool. Uh, more oftentimes we maybe see that in commercial production. Maybe a low tunnels are a little bit more practical for the homeowner. Uh, and then cold frames as well. Um, cold frames are kind of like a box um, that we maybe have on the warm side of our house uh, and then have sort of a clear type covering over it uh, where light can still infiltrate into that and sort of warm that up. Um, so if you're trying to start transplants, um, or maybe kind of have um, some, some small scale stuff, a, a cold frame can be a really good option. Um, also another way to kind of keep that cold frame warm would be to maybe insulate it too with some hay bales or some compost or something like that. Maybe dig it a little bit into the ground um, can be a way to sort of give us this nice little area that we can work in when, when things really start to, start to get cold. Um, so again, thank you all for joining me this evening. Real quick, just a couple resources to go through. Um, we have our fact sheet website through Oklahoma State Extension. Um, you can search on here, you can search any topic you want to, and it will pull up uh, the fact sheets with that information in it. Um, recently too, they've overhauled this to also include anything on news releases or press releases. Um, so it's, it's a little bit more robust than what we had beforehand and it's really good. So you should check it out. 
Um, we do have a great fall gardening fact sheet um, that has uh, a lot of things that we talked about this evening, but it is just kind of a great reference um, if, you're, if you're looking to learn more about fall gardening. Also some resources, we're on social media, so check us out on Facebook and Instagram. Uh, we'll post gardening tips. Um, if we start to see something come through the office pretty frequently, um, and we're seeing a lot of it, uh, you know, couple, last month we were seeing a ton of spider mites, so we were like, hey, we're seeing this, here's some control information. Uh, and then we also post about events and different classes that we teach, so um, please check us out and like our social media pages to keep up to date with the stuff that we are doing. Um, so thank you all so much for joining me this evening. Um, I will stick around for any other questions you have. Um, but again, I, I hope you learned something and I hope you all have wonderful, robust fall gardens this year. Thank you all. Brittany, you have a lot of questions. You a ready? lot of questions, okay. Okay, so can different seeds slash plants be planted closer than recommended spacing such as peas and lettuce? Or um, Rachel shared that she planted a pea next to a lettuce. Oh, sorry, her example is I plant a pea next to a lettuce plant. Okay, so like if you're mixing it, can you kind of sort of push those closer together? Is that what I think is, okay. Oh yeah, that's what you're asking, okay, got a thumbs up. Um, you, could, you could do that, um, but I would, um, generally those, the closer you put them together, the more they're gonna compete for nutrients, they're gonna compete for space. So if you're planting them in inner space like that, I would probably go with the bigger interval just to make sure that there's no, less competition um, and things like that. Because if you push them too close together, you're going to start to get competition and they're, they're just not, they might grow and you might have, um, you know, some harvest off of it, but you might not um, have this it to the same potential that it would be if they had just a little bit more room to spread out and get comfortable. Okay. So then Sharon wants to know, what are some good determinant tomato varieties for central Oklahoma? Oh, gosh. Okay. Um, I couldn't tell you that off the top of my head, but there are a lot. Um, what I will encourage you to do is to go check out that fact sheet website. We have a fact sheet um, called Vegetable Varieties for Oklahoma, and all of the vegetable varieties in there have been uh, tested by our specialists in Stillwater, um, and that will be where that information is. Off the top of my head, I'm afraid I don't, I can't tell you off the top of my head. Okay, so then Pat wants to know, she said she planted a lot of broccoli early in June, it germinated and the tops have been eaten, and now the they're leafing out again. Can she transplant, can I transplant seedlings or cut to thin and use as microgreens? Um, if they are, you can, you can, you can eat brassicas and the broccoli and everything as microgreens. Um, you don't want them to be typically too tall. Um, generally you want them to just have, um, their first true leaves. Any more than that, and they're going to kind of be woody and, um, maybe not have the same characteristics of microgreens as we think that they are. Um, if they've had on broccoli, if they've had the tops of them chewed off, you're not going to get that big terminal bud that is the broccoli we see in the grocery store. You might still get side shoots, um, but you're not going to get that same terminal, terminal broccoli that um, we typically think of when we think of broccoli. Okay, so then for squash, will mulch encourage squash bug infestation? Squash bugs do like mulch. That is true, they do. <laughs> um, they like to hide underneath it and um, har harbor, harbor in there. Um, and two, once we um, pull them out for the next year, if we leave that mulch there, the eggs will hang out in there uh, for the following season. So yes, squash bugs do like mulch, um, but it, it's kind of a darned if you do, darned if you don't thing, because you really kind of do need um, that mulch for the moisture retention and, um, and, and to regulate the temperature of the soil. Um, so a trick with squash bugs that I think might come in handy 
for you is um, you can lay down a board next to your squash plants and the squash bugs will actually harbor underneath that board thinking that it's some kind of mulch. And then when you go, uh, when you go in the morning to check on them and water, flip that board over and you should have a nice population of squash bugs underneath there that you can go in and smash before the day starts. Um, so that's kind of a uh, home remedy, organic way to kill your squash bugs um, where you can have your mulch and your, um, and, and your squash. But I will say if you are growing squash and you do have squash bugs and you have had it in mulch, I would rake, I would rake that mulch back and maybe put it in your compost pile um, because squash bugs will overwinter in that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I read that you can, should plant strawberries this fall to be ready for the spring. And if so, is that from seed? When it comes to planting strawberries, what they're, what, what generally they're talking about are going to be called crowns. Um, crowns are, um, or, or they're kind of like roots. Um, but basically it's, it's sort of a dried out plant with the roots and the tops. Um, there's not really any necessarily leafy green growth. Um, you wouldn't want to plant any strawberries that have leafy green growth uh, this fall because then it's just going to freeze and that leafy green growth is going to die. Um, so you're kind of sort of starting out with these crowns and you could plant, you, you can plant those in the fall uh, for harvest in the spring. Okay. Um, oh, sorry. <clears throat> oh no, if that answers your question. Okay, so the uh, Carolyn said that OSU fact sheets are awesome and lots of thank yous. And what's your Facebook group page again? It is just Cleveland County Horticulture. Okay, and then what was your fax sheet address again? That one. Okay, and Alita said she's stoked about her fall garden. Lots and lots of compliments. And then one more, I planted everything very close together and did not have the heart to thin them. Now some are producing and some are not. Should I pull the ones that are not so they're not using up the nutrients? Instead of pulling, what I would do is get yourself some scissors and go in and chop them off. If you pull, if they're big and they're entangled with each other uh, and you start pulling them off, you might damage some of the pre-existing plants that are already there and starting to be successful. Um, so just go ahead and chop them off. The, the bottom of the plant and the roots that are still there will die and they'll decompose. Um, but trying to get in there and pulling them up might hurt your plants that are already existing. So if they're tangled together, I'd go that route. Okay. So then can you plant cauliflower? Is that a yes. fall? Okay. Yeah, that's a fall one too. It's very similar to broccoli. Um, I just didn't have it as an example tonight. Okay. Is there something you should do to treat the soil this fall to kill the eggs before next spring? I'm assuming whatever bugs lay eggs. Um, I, I don't think there's really any options for homeowners that necessarily treat the soil for eggs. Um, I know of some, but generally they're more commercial type, more commercial type products and commercial type additives. Um, so some of the things you can do to help with that next year would be crop rotation. So crop rotation would be to plant, um, let's say you had squash in a raised bed and there's overwintering squash bugs in there. They're ready. They're ready to get that squash. So next year, instead of planting your squash in that raised bed, choose another family of crops, like maybe tomatoes um, or peppers or something from that family to plant in there. And then that way, when the squash bugs hatch, they're like, well, where's my food? Where's my food? And they have to go and find it elsewhere. Um, so crop rotation can really kind of trick those bugs and those insects that have overwintered. Uh, okay. Because if you plant the same thing in the same spot year after year, they'll catch on. Okay. So then, do you have any tips for controlling ants? Ants made a home with my eggplant, and even though I dug up the eggplant and moved it, the ants followed. No, I'm sorry. I yeah, ants are ants are tricky. Generally, ants um, they don't like to be disturbed too much. So if you've had a vegetable garden and you've been continually working that spot, generally the ants are gonna get the idea and they're gonna move. 
But if you've got ants in your vegetable bed, it's really a good idea to maybe um, treat that area before you start planting um, vegetable crops in it. Um, so maybe um, there's various products that have baits or things where you can spray the individual ant mounds. Um, but you might look to doing something like that and then um, waiting the recommended amount of time before putting vegetables in that spot. And making sure you don't have aphids since they farm aphids. Yes, ants also farm aphids. So if you have aphids and ants, then it's a double whammy. <laughs> so Courtney, your previous class on pests, mm -hmm. is that on your Facebook page where they can get it or is that on your OSU Extension website? Uh, it is on, um, it's on our YouTube channel. Our YouTube channel isn't very robust, so I haven't uh, mentioned it, but um, we have been putting our past webinars on YouTube. So it's just Cleveland County Horticulture on YouTube. Um, but you're by all means welcome to check that out um, for previous classes that we've done. Okay, and it looks like maybe the last one, unless someone sneaks one in, is coffee grounds are good for plants, correct? Yes. Coffee grounds generally are good for plants. Um, it's going to lower the pH of the soil uh, over time. You have to kind of add a lot of it, but over time it's going to acidify that soil. Um, and veggies do generally like it more acidic than basic. Um, so kind of more in that 6 to 6.8 pH range. Um, it makes a really good, you know, um, mulch if you want to work that in. Um, it's also great in your compost bin. Um, so if you want to add it to your compost bin, work it out, uh, work it in, um, can also kind of benefit you that way. Um, but yes, uh, coffee grounds generally are a great thing to add to your soil. Um, now, uh, I always, you know, kind of think about don't uh, necessarily go buy coffee grounds and put them in the soil. Um, use them or go to local coffee shops. Um, it's, there are a lot of other cheaper ways than going out and buying coffee grounds and doing it, but if you've got leftover coffee grounds from the coffee pot, by all means use them. Courtney, was the compost the same? That was separate from the bugs, right? Because you've got a compost video too. Yes, our last class was on composting and then the one and before that was on bugs. Okay. And those are both on our, our, uh, our slowly growing, not so robust YouTube channel. Okay, well, they're fantastic. I think that looks like, oh, do you have more classes scheduled and do you have one next month specifically? Oh, yes. Um, thank you for asking that. September, let me look up my calendar. We are doing one on protecting pollinators in the garden. Um, it is going to be on September 16th. Do you have that made as a Facebook event yet? Um, I do not. I probably will have it done by the end of this week. <laughs> okay. Is it on your calendar or anything anywhere where they can? Yeah. It's on our, um, it's on the OSU calendar. Um, and then it's also been in our newsletter, but it'll be on the Facebook page by the end of the week. Um, and those of you, uh, who are still with us this evening, we do have a newsletter that gets sent out with all of our upcoming events. Um, when I send out the post assessment, I usually send out a click here to join our newsletter. So um, that's probably the quickest way to find out about events that we're doing. Hey, well, you've got Carolyn said, yes, please, more classes. Looking forward to seeing this. Good, good. That makes me happy. I'm glad. Hey, looks like, looks like we got them all. All right. Thanks, guys. I appreciate the questions. It's weird sometimes talking to a void and, and not seeing people. Um, but so I really appreciate questions and feedback. <laughs> all right. Thank you all. Can you for a minute with me? Yeah, I'll hang on with you. Okay. I'm going to stop recording. Do you want to stop recording? Yes, I want to stop recording once I figure out how to do it.